So I like following on Instagram. I like following sports people, kind of all sorts of random ones as well. So me personally, um, not necessarily just, um, you know, Djokovic, but I like following like the 143rd tennis player in the world or a college basketball player Please. or, you know, a footballer for, for, from Luton. Just, I like finding these accounts. <laughs> well, they're Premier League side now, Doug. Premier yeah, League side now. That's okay. Maybe that's too generous. Um, if you said Aldershot, maybe. Yeah, that's more the vibe, actually. And you get some really, uh, away from the very, very top level, you do get some quite interesting accounts where, you know, the PR guys aren't anywhere, anywhere near it. There's a lot of, like, you know, athletes that have quite cool accounts, and you can literally just watch them you know, their training regimes in, you know, they've gone to the Canary Islands and you can see that in quite a bit of detail. I personally, for me, love it. And they do have pretty big followings. Even these, you know, totally off of social media, no one on the street would have heard of them, athletes. Um, And in the US, as a sort of side point, in the US college athletes, another massive one. They have huge followings. They're, you know, they're young, they're hip, um, People want to be like them. Those guys have huge followings. And very recently, they've been able to kind of monetize those followings. So what works really well, I think, are brand plays with those influencers. So, you know, some vitamin company wants to break into the market, going to, you know, a Polish 400-meter runner who's got 100,000 followers on Instagram or TikTok is probably a really good way of doing it because their followers are generally, I would guess, pretty engaged. Me personally, if I see something that one of those athletes is using, I take way more interest in that than if, say, an elite athlete or, you know, those influencers that just, like, go to places. Just that, for me, is a nonsense. But these athletes, I think, have really good brand loyalty and and really good ability to push products. So what's the idea? The idea is a, a very specialist high touch agency that works probably with sports people but it could even just be like two or three sports helping those influencers go and get brand deals with you know whoever so you're kind of like a social media agent and then you just take a cut from the deals that you make for them so it's total marketplace play but it is high touch it's personal you build the relationship with you know, John, the college basketball player from Detroit. And then you've got a load of brands on this side. And you're like, okay, let's get that, you know, let's get that relationship built. And then just work. Like, I don't, this is a bit I don't know anything about, but like, how do you, um, how do you, how do you get any data to show it's working? How do you kind of, um, how do you know which brands to choose? How do you actually like insert the brand into the content without it being hideous? Like, but all of those things, there, there are answers for that's been done a million times. But I think helping those people generate revenue and, and sitting in the middle is the way forward. So we have an investment in a business called Whisper. Um, they work with what's called friendfluencing, right? But it's so basically highly localized, lower following, so nano influencers, with the idea that you're going to understand or you're going to be more impacted by one of your friends or people that you actually know's opinion than you are some you know person who's got 17 million followers who you never met so i completely understand the 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 influence piece if it doesn't even come from a top shelf kind of influencer if you will the interesting piece around this is the other side of it finding brands that want to work with that with that with that um influence pretty much managed by agencies that have all the brand relationships to begin with and then they tend to then go and populate this with the, with the with the people that they think are interesting. So I think rather than agency, I think you have to be agent. So you are actually agent for them. And then you're going to go to the thousands influencer marketing agencies that have got client relationship and you're going to go and essentially pitch your person. You know, so because I I'm certain that people get signed to marketing agencies or marketing influencer agencies, they do, right? And they often see for work, see this, for work, see this. But I think if you proactively went and built a big book or a book that's big enough that you could still serve, you know, a la Jerry Maguire and not go too big, but it was of a certain tier that are maybe getting overlooked by the big boys and you would, you have, you have contacts, not with directly with brands, because I don't think you're going to be able to do that, but you have contacts with those marketing agencies that are the intermediary between your, your athlete and 
that brand. That's the piece you've got to go and get on the other side of the marketplace, I think, because the brands are signed up for years to these influencer marketing agencies. And that's actually way simpler because these athletes are basically endless. The pool of them is hundreds of thousands. So you can, and there's new ones coming all the time. So basically your outreach strategy to them can be really automated, can be, you can scrape all of that data from the socials, reach out to them um, and, and try and build it on that side. I think from the business model side, I love the idea that you get paid for pitching. Like if you and I are running this business, I would feel really, I would enjoy a business where I had to go and pitch an athlete to tell me who, like Ford, probably not Ford because at that level, but you know, whatever you had to go and pitch an athlete to, you know, Roback is like a um, emerging golf brand, really good. R-H-O-B-A-C-K. Um, and then the other way I think you do it that is that the athlete isn't, isn't tied in. They don't have to be tied into you. You're just going and doing one brand deal for them rather than doing this laborious, you know, um, you know, John, we've, we're going to sign you on for two years. We're going to be your, cause they're going to be nervous about that. They're not going to want to do that. It's going to be a long process. Just say, look, we do this. We find brand deals. Um, this is the type of deal we find. If we find you this deal, you get this, we get this. We do all the hard work for you. We know how to pitch you. We know the brands. And then you are literally pumping out like a hundred of these guys all the time. You're just doing the outreach to the, to the agency, doing the pictures, getting the deals signed. And I think very quickly you'd understand what they want and what they don't want and then what athletes they're looking for. I mean, I'm sure I could guess it now, but. Sorry, I cut you there. Um, it's not about understanding necessarily what they, well, it is to a degree that, but it's building the relationship. All of this shit is relationship partnership based. You know, I've, I've seen, I've, I've spoken to enough people in influencer marketing, everything else like that. It's like, oh, let's, let's use this person because we know them. Let's use this because we think they've got that. Because you can massage and manipulate the campaigns that you put through to suit the person that you've got coming in. But I, th I do think it's, if you were to do that, the relationships that you would build in the marketing space and with the athletes would be insane. And that network alone is worth value. That relationship with said person over at second string marketing influencer agency that have just signed a small Adidas deal for Romania, that that relationship is valuable. It is is the way it works, you know, Adidas Romania has probably just got one person working on you know, they've got to spend $100,000 on influencer marketing. That's their budget. And they need to go and find athletes to, to do that. Do you think that's how it works? And you need to build that relationship with that person. Yeah, I think either directly at brand or the agency that have signed Adidas yeah. for Eastern Europe. Do you think it would be, it's, it'd be a mix, yeah. wouldn't it? The smaller brands, probably it's maybe in-house. The, the the bigger brands have got an agency that's doing it on their behalf. And they're just, they're just spending budget. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the chaps that came on the golf weekend this weekend has been running an influencer marketing agency for about 10 years. Um, and from what I see from afar, I haven't had many too many conversations with him. That seems the way it is. We work with a very interesting agency called MGM Power. They're more in the, well, they, they do seem to do a lot in fashion, but it's, they work with influencers of varying sizes. But, you know, some of their, some of their clients are actually, you know, FTSE, FTSE companies. Whereas the other side of it, Whisper, super super kind of low small large volume influencers very localized targeted marketing because it's about friends and immediate networks sub 2000 followers type i stuff. think there's the, loads the of way ranges. this works in in the sports space let's just say we stick in sports i think the way this works mm. is you specialize in a sport probably so you specialize in you know we have athletes of which would be you know hundreds of thousands probably in Europe, you know, all the long jumpers and runners and that kind of thing. Because then you can really sort of have credibility when you go to, you know, you go to the agency or the brand, you're like, look, we know who the good athletes are. We have mapped the entire of of continental Europe for athlete Instagram accounts. Not only have we like found them, fine, you could do that, but we have looked at engagement. We have, and have that as a data play. Look, we know engagement. We've got metrics on like, how many followers, how much engagement from those followers. And we know the content. We know exactly what each of those people is posting. And that we've we've then tagged all of that with like the type of brand that would work. And then you just bring in them this database of 80,000 athletes and just saying, look, you could do this yourself, 
but we've got the IP, we've done the hard work, we know exactly where you need to place your marketing dollars. Um, oh, and and by the way, we we know how to get in touch with these athletes. We've got a model of business. business. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a thing called Creator HQ, um, which does a lot of the data tracking and people plug into it so they can see all of the posts in those regions by those people and all of the kind of ROI that you get. So a lot of that already works. So you could get hold of that data relatively easily. I think the, the play for me, the play here is that identification of the athlete because they're the, the asset, the building of the relationship with the agencies. And then that I, I really like the short term, you know, not no win, no fee. But if you if you are, or maybe it is that, maybe it's a higher cut, no win, no fee, and you just you take a run at it, side hustle until you manage to pull off a deal, and then you can kind of do it. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, it's interesting, but I think it's got to be an agent approach rather than an agency for me. If you had to set up a car washing franchise tomorrow or an influencer agent for that model, mm. which one would you set up? Car. Really? Why? It's easier. And I could look I could look at that and I know I've got to acquire space. I know I've got to acquire franchisees, that's selling. I know I've got to acquire materials, but you could run a financial model of what that looks like, piece of piss, take half a day to figure it out. You need to understand what your training materials are like, design a brand and then put a marketing strategy together. And then you can literally start it yourself. That's easy. I would take a run at that. Scale, you know, what are you going to get? You need to probably get 20, 30, 40 sites before you're really going to make mega money. But still that. If I look at dealing with people sometimes maybe ego and high level sport if i look at that i look at the the competitive influence of marketing space that i know very little of really that um i just think the barriers to entry for success there with no network starting is difficult if i've got network and i know the influencer agencies then i would have a leg up in that industry whereas i don't need a leg up in car washing yeah for me for me car washing thing makes me nervous I, I, finding the unit like I've got to deal with a lease I've got to deal with like I've got to buy some cloths you know I've got to I've got to get these little machines that work I've got to kind of you've got to put the cash in up front as well just to get the location and see mm. that it works for me I get give me a phone give me like creator mm-hmm. HQ and just give me two weeks mm-hmm. and I, I'm just going to go, just going to send out a thousand messages, you know, some on one side, some on the other side of the market and just try and hack a deal together. I'd back us if you just put us in a room with two phones and some headsets that we'd have a deal done within two weeks. What we what would be great to get to a position of, and we can tie this episode off with this, is like July 2024, we cherry pick one of the ideas we come up with and we clear it or clear it somehow to spend two weeks and taking a run at things and see what kind of impact we get and come back and say which was easiest. Not necessarily these two ideas, <laughs> but two ideas. Yeah, and it's got to be something that, you know, you can measure the impact and it's going to be, I love the idea of just yeah. a boiler room. You're just in there on the phone. You got, you're got yeah. hacking some tech together. You're working at Creator HQ. I've literally got a headset and a phone. <laughs> Is it a landline? It's a fucking, it's, it's a landline. A landline it's, it? you know, some VoIP or whatever and I'm just there and... It, it, there's, there's a whiteboard and it's 150 dials every day. That's what it is. Yeah, and it says always be closing on it, ABC. Yeah, and if I get a deal... Yeah, maybe a picture of Alec, Alec Baldwin. Yeah, if there's a deal, there's music. <laughs> I would, depending on the market, I would absolutely back back that we could do something there. And that sports one, for example. Okay. Yeah, magic. Thank you very much, Doug. That was really enjoyable. I'll see you on the next. Take care, mate. <laughs>